phase changes release oh anywhere from about 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 2 kilojoules of energy. Chemical changes uh, like the ones we've just been doing with the propane burning and the methane, those range from the hundreds to the thousands, 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 kilojoules in terms of how much energy they can release. Nuclear, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 per mole of reactant. Oh my goodness, that's an unbelievable amount of heat because actually in a nuclear reaction you're converting matter into energy according to Einstein's equation. Oh man, no kidding, that's something else, isn't it? Now, here's the thing. For nuclear chemistry, uh, generally in the high school level, you just got to know a few things. One is that when you have a nuclear equation and you have written elements in their mass number and atomic number uh, uh, scripts, that the reactants and products must conserve mass number and atomic number. So, take a look. 92 and 0, that's a neutron hitting uranium by the way, and when neutrons hit uranium they can split, form barium and krypton, and release massive amounts of energy. So, the mass numbers here equal 92, and 56 and 36 is 92. 235 plus 1 is 236, and 141 plus 92 is 233. Two we're missing 3 as a number. Well, you know what we're missing? We're missing the fact that three neutrons come off. So always be careful and make sure your equation is balanced. And when it doesn't balance properly, you probably need to add neutrons somewhere. Okay, this reaction right here is involved in nuclear react reactors all over the world. And nuclear reactors just release massive quantities of energy to boil water. The water is driven through those pipes, just like I told you at the beginning, with the coal-fired plant or the methane-powered uh, plants. And what they do is, they spin turbines to produce electricity. So we use nuclear energy to really produce electricity through the boiling of water. Quite simple. So with an understanding of all of these energy sources that we've been talking about, you may be asked to do a type of risk-benefit analysis as to what type of energy we should be using on this planet. Now, I've listed some of the ones that we've been talking about, and then there are some other ones here that we haven't really discussed yet. But in terms of a risk-benefit analysis, you can easily put things together from, from your common sense. Nuclear, of course, is quite dangerous because of many reasons, really. Nuclear power uh, releases such a quantity of heat that it sometimes can be uncontrolled and can lead to a meltdown of a facility that's actually creating electricity from it. So. Uh, that can be very dangerous. Also because of the radioactive waste that's involved with nuclear energy because when you are actually turning matter to energy you're splitting that nucleus. Gamma rays, x-rays, UV rays, the things we talked about uh, uh, before at the beginning of this DVD. Well those things are released and absorbed by the products of the reaction like the krypton and barium uh, that we had in that previous reaction. So they're, they're radioactive and you have to dispose of that. Where? You bury it in the ground? Not a good idea. So, shoot it into space? Yeah, if the rocket blows up in the air, oh, you're in trouble. So, there's risk-benefit analysis for nuclear. Now, fossil fuels, I mean, this is what we really use in the largest quantity on the planet, whether it's coal, oil, or natural gas. But fossil fuels can produce acid rain because the sulfur that's usually in these fuels that we can't get out well, precipitates back to the ground as acidic deposition. We'll talk about that in the acid-base disk, too. So that's pretty nasty. And then hot burning car engines produce nitrogen oxides, which also contribute to acid rain. And then carbon dioxide, of course, that comes off of here, here leads to the greenhouse effect. So fossil fuels are pretty nasty too. The great alternatives would be wind, solar, hydro. If we could properly harness these guys, these are renewable resources as opposed to these non-renewables, and these would be great to be able to use. And of course, Wind, we've seen wind generation uh, with, uh, with windmills, we can make electricity, solar power from solar panels, hydro, we've got dams that actually take gravitational potential energy uh, from the water and are able to convert that to electricity. Geothermal is one that's very interesting because that's just heat that comes out of the ground. In Iceland, they actually use that heat that comes out of geysers in the ground to be able to turn the turbines to make electricity. These ones all renewable. Well, geothermal is 
considered a renewable resource just because it keeps on coming up out of the earth. It's not quite renewable. But these are also, wind, solar, and hydro, they are solar energy renewable resources. So very safe, but sometimes very expensive. And those might be the detractors from uh, using these now. But somehow, somewhere, we've got to get out of those fossil fuels, don't you think?